Should I hit record? There you go. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll just introduce you. I'll just say one line and then I'll, I'll hand it to Dr. Lansky. So it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Daniel Shami, who's joined us uh, here from uh, from Brazil. He's an interventional cardiologist and, and uh, a specialist in intracoronary imaging with a vast uh, clinical and research experience. Uh, I'll let Dr. Lansky say a couple of words to uh, all of us know us, but for, for those who, who haven't met Daniel already. Thanks, Kartik. Um, I just want to um, welcome Daniel to, to our team at Yale. Um, Daniel came, uh, when was it? In, in August, I think. So he's been with us now for a couple of months, and we're just really excited to have him come on board um, to establish our uh, imaging program. I think we have a lot of really excellent ideas to, to grow this program, and it's going to be both uh, based um, in the academics as well as in the cath lab. So, uh, Daniel, I'm going to turn it over to you and, uh, you know, looking forward to this talk. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Karthik, I just need to yes. be able to share. You. Now you should be. Okay. Thank you. So it's a, a really a, a real pleasure to, to be here in this morning talking about something that had, is being part of my life in interventional cardiology since the beginning when I started my, my training. And I was thinking on how to present that to, to this EAO group who already uses a lot of imaging. So I tried it, uh, I'll not focus too much on the data, but to really try to discuss some clinical applications and as much as I can, I'll present my own cases such as um, to serve as, as examples for each scenario that I want to show. So I have no disclosures about this presentation. And over the next uh, minutes, we're, I'll try to go over so the use of, on the use of imaging for diagnosis of you know, coronary disease, stenosis quantification, PCI guidance, which is the main driver of imaging here, show some, some case examples on special scenarios, discuss a little bit of stent failure, and try to take a look at on the actual intravascular imaging use and the barriers for adoption. So number one, to, to understand what is diseased, we need to look at what is normal. So the, a normal vessel, as you can see here on IVUS and OCT, and on this presentation, I'll focus on these two imaging modalities, which are the ones that we currently use for clinical decision and guidance. So a normal vessel has usually a three-layered uh, appearance, as you can see here, the, ad, the, the advent, I'm sorry, the intima, the media, and the adventitia, and the media is, is a smooth muscle layer which reflects ultrasound and light in a much lower intensity than the media and the adventitia, and then the intima and then the adventitia, with, which makes the three-layered appearance since the media appears dark in the middle. Every time we lose the, this three-layered aspect on OCT, we call this an, a lesion. And there are some disagreement on what is the transition from a normal to a, a pathological intimal thickening and then lesion. But when we look at, you know, old papers from the from, from Vrimani's group in the 90s um, on a population based um, pathology, 250 microns is kind of the cutoff that would separate men and woman, you know, middle age, 50 years um, from an intimal thickening to a proper disease. So when we have disease, it's pretty clear. And if we focus on the lower row here on OCT, even if I don't describe anything here, it's pretty evident that fibrotic lesions are different from calcium, they're different from lipid. And what we look at here are a, a component. It's a twofold component. We take a look at how the tissue brights or shines light back to the catheter. We call that a backscattering. So how the light is backscattered from the tissue uh, back to the catheter. So if the tissue reflects light a lot, it's going to be brighter than if it reflects less. And we also take a look at how the tissue attenuates light, if it allows light to pass through or it blocks light completely. So using these two components, you can, you're, you're going to be able to classify anything. So if you take a look at the fibrotic plaque, it's a, it has a high intensity signal, which means it has a high backscattering 
and a low attenuation since we can see the deep, deeper layers of the vessel. Calcium, on the other hand, reflects light less in the backwards direction, but more in you know, diagonal, lateral, and forward directions. So the intensity of light that returns back to the catheter is smaller, which means that this lesion here is lower intensity than the fibrotic tissue that surrounds it. But at the same time, calcium allows light to penetrate. So it has also a low attenuation. So low backscattering with low attenuation, which means that we can see the entire border of calcium. We can determine the area, we can determine the thickness, and we can see the deeper layers of the vessel. <laughs> Lipid has a very bright surface, which is composed by fibrotic tissue, which is the fibrous cap that is overlaying the lipid pool. So it has a high backscattering in, in, in the surface, but when light really hits the lipid, lipid attenuates completely light, which makes different from calcium, we can't define boundaries. So it's a low attenuation, it's a high attenuation with low backscattering. So high backscattering, low attenuation, low, low, and high attenuation, and nothing else here. So it's totally different, and we can easily separate the three components. When we look at the IVUS now, we classify plaques according to the intensity of the plaque and using the advent tissue as a reference. So lipid ha has low echogenicity than the advent tissue. Calcium has a higher e uh, echogenicity than advent tissue, followed by a shadow. And fibrotic plaques is really a complete mess. It should have the same intensity as the advent tissue. But since these are paired uh, cross sections, and when you look at this dense fibrosis here, what we have here is a thickening of the media, which makes, makes it appear as a deep lipid pool behind, when in fact it's just fibrosis all the way. So it's sometimes very difficult to separate lipid and from, from fibrotic tissues or lose connective tissue. So plaque characterization on IVUS is something that we refrain from using, except for calcium, and we try not to, to differentiate much you know, fibrotic from lipids, or we, we don't have much uh, clarity in defining lipid pools by IVUS, for, except for some situations. OCT has also advanced for, you know, allows us to advantage in plaque morphology and take a look at all the vulnerable aspects and the ACS causes. So on top of those three components that I mentioned, we can also take a look at inflammation, such as infiltration of macrophage that you can see as these spotty high intensity uh, structures that are deep on the fibrous cap surface. We have a thick fa, a thin cap fibroteroma, which is a lipid pool followed by a very thin uh, fibrous cap, which should, be low, which should be below 65 microns to be defined as a thick fa. We can take a look at neo inter interplaque uh, neo vessels which are related to intraplaque hemorrhage and then ACS. And when we have the event properly, we, it's pretty easy to identify a plaque rupture. On a, this is a case of a plaque rupture on a, on a STEMI case that I had, a lipid pool rupture discontinuity here on, this, on the luminal surface. The picture speaks by itself, some residual thrombus here on the top corner. Black erosion is, is a diagnosis that was only possible by pathology and OCT allows us to make this diagnosis in vivo and is characterized by the presence of thrombus that is a, adhering to the, to the vascular surface, but we don't see any plaque rupture here. Calcified nodules are protrusion of calcium that ruptures the fibrous cap and protrudes into the lumen and is also associated with vulnerability and ACS in kind of seven to 8% of the cases. Spontaneous dissection, hematoma here, pushing the, the intima inwards and the adventitia outwards. This half moon appearance is the characteristic appearance of a, of a SCAD. And we can also differentiate thrombus, which is an irregular mass floating into the lumen or attached to the vessel, whatever it is. Um, but we can separate those according to the timing and component. So if it's a fresh red thrombus, 
red blood cells attenuate a lot all the light. So we will have a very bright surface. And as light comes into the red blood cells, it, it attenuates everything. And we can see this shadow, which does not allow us to see anything behind the thrombus. White thrombus, on the other hand, has much less red blood cells. So it's more fibrin and, and, um, and leukocytes. So we, you can see through thrombus. And we can determine the area, the mass, and still see the vessel wall behind. So there are some data showing that when we classify lesions, this can have some clinical impact. So this is the erosion tree trial. Very small trial mechanistic. So 250 patients that came with STEMI, they did angio and aspiration if needed. The goal was to have TB3 flow and the, the diameter stenosis is less than 70%. And then they did OCT guidance in one group, which was randomized. And if this plaque had erosions, scad, spasm, or ruptures without dissection, then these patients were treated conservatively without stenting, as opposed to regular care, just guided by angel. So what they saw was a 15% less use of stents on these categories here. And most of the times, these were erosion lesion, eroded lesions, and some, some others were uh, plaque ruptures without lumen compromise. And we also saw that those lesions had a favorable, more favorable phenotype with less lipid, less thin cap fibroatheroma, and less inflammation. As a re and as a result of that, on a very short follow-up, period, at least in the first month, the recurrence of events was not higher than um, the regular standard care. So maybe this could be, um, this is something that is a hypothesis generate, generating data that says that if you have erosion or ruptures without um, any lumen compromise, you can maybe keep this patient without stenting and this patient will heal and do well. Another Italian study with more than a thousand patients, looked now at non compared proximal LED lesions. So this is a very specific population. So they had a thousand patients with ACS, the culprit was the RCA or the left circ, and they looked at the proximal LED lesions. They did OCT baseline and looked at the morphology and aspects of the lesion. And they found, a, a, you know, a, an increasing uh, re, um, risk of events which was higher at 7.5% at the end of the first year, if you have four of the major components, an MLA less than 3.5 mm square millimeters, a fibrous cap thickness is more than 75, so 10 micrometers above the pathological description by Virmani, a lipid arc greater than 180 degrees and inflammation through macrophage infiltration. So if you have the combination of these four, uh, phenotypes here, the risk of events in the first year is pretty high, 7.5%. And this is also in line with a more recent study, which is called the combined FFROCT, which looked at diabetic patients that had non corporate ACS lesions. So they imaged the lesions when, and if the FFR was less than eight, they revascularized those lesions as standard of care. So the, the focus here was on the non-obstructive lesions with FFR greater than 0.8, and they imaged those lesions with OCT. Just, and they just took a look at the morphology and they realized that thickfa occurs in one part of those non corporate lesions or non-flow limiting lesions in diabetic patients. And these tick lesions had 4.5% more events than the more stable plaques. They updated the follow-up to five years. It was just recent uh, published this month in Neuro Intervention. And this is still at five years, the risk of events is close to threefold if you have uh, a tick So it, 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 catches, it continues catching up on long-term if you have those high risk lesions. The problem is you have a non-obstructive lesion, features of vulnerability, should it stent it? So that's the clinical question. What should we do with those lesions? Going back in time, Prospect was the first study to assess you know, prospective lesion treatment 
um, for vulnerability. The imaging modality at the time was IVUS VH. They also showed that when you have an IVUS VH TICFA with a plaque burden greater than 70% and an MLA less than four, the risk of events is huge. We're talking about 11 fold in, in risk. The problem is when you stent those lesions, so the, the risk of events over time at the end of three years is pretty much the same to the culprit lesions that have been treated to the non-culprit lesions that had these vulnerable uh, aspects over time. So putting a stent at the time, first generation DES and so on, had the same uh, amount of events as a, just the natural history of the lesion. So why should we stent it and not try intensive medical care? The prospect absorb came with a different proposal. Now we have a polymeric scaffold that is going to seal the plaque baseline and it will disappear over time. So we don't have the ongoing um, risk related to stents. But again, the risk of event was the same when they used it, it, they used here near IVUS, so more uh, ability to, to identify lipid, but still the risk of events was pretty much the same as uh, guideline directed medical therapy. So there is no role for preventive stenting so far. We can identify those lesions, the high risk lesions, and we have a lot of modalities showing, we, we, we can see all the features by multiple modalities. But the problem is our positive predictive value is pretty low to identify which individual lesions that have those, all those variables of vulnerability will in fact unstabilize and generate an ACS. So that's why we, we, we Daniel, don't this know. Is to me, I just had a quick question yeah. about that. So does that look at um, target lesion or are you talking about target vessel? So like does stunting the lesion mean that you might have a-, a The stunting the lesion. So it, this is a lesion-based um, event. Thanks. Right. So, but, but on the other hand, the negative predictive value is pretty high. So if you don't have all these vulnerable black features, then you're, you know that you're in a safe ground. The problem is we identify the vulnerability, but we just can't predict which ones are going to generate an ACS. A quick word about stenosis quantification. So we always uh, are trained on looking at the MLA, the plaque burden, we quantify how severe is the stenosis and the way, so on a systematic way, the way we do it, we define the lesion, we take a look at the tightest portion, the lumen area, and then we compare this lumen area against the references, which can be the distal, the proximal, or the average of both. So you have three options here and you use the one that is better suited for the anatomy that you're looking at. OCT also gives the same. So since the borders are very clear, the machine gives you this lumen profile, which is an automatic segmentation of the lumen throughout the entire pullback and automatically defines what is the tightest region here. The MLA is presented and then the MLA is compared against the references that we define. So we have 79% stenosis against the distal, 81% against the proximal and 80% against the average of both. So it's quantifiable, it's automatic, it's easy. The problem is to predict the functional significance, then I, I try to, this is a busy slide, I try to make it in one slide and I made this graph. So you, you get a sense. So I, I did a crude mean uh, after all the studies have compared when they used IVUS MLA to compare with FFR and OCT MLA to compare with FFR. So you see that for IVUS, the mean MLA is 2.86 and it ranges from 2.36 to four. So if you look at the positive predictive value, which means if I have an, a lesion with an MLA lesser than, smaller than 2.8, my chance of predicting is less than 50%, which is ridiculous. So if you look at the overall accuracy, it's 67%. OCT increases a little bit the, the positive predictive value because we have more resolution to define the lumen borders, but still the accuracy is still below 80%. So if you're looking at a stable patient, you know, there is an intermediate lesion, you just want to do imaging to take a look at the MLA plaque and see if you should stent it. Maybe if you want to take a look at the functional significance, physiology here is the, is the tool to use. 
moving to PCI guidance, and this is the core burden of imaging. So there are at the moment 24 randomized trials, 85 registries, and 32 meta analyses that compared IVUS or OCT with angiography. So we summarized all the evidence in this publication that is already ahead of print at JSKY website. I see that Dominic is here, so he's the responsible for, for this. So it's already there. It's a summary of all the evidence, all the randomized trials, the registries, and the meta-analysis. So I'll not bother to go over in detail, but just a, a rough summary. So these are the 23 meta-analyses that compared IVUS with angio-guided PCI. And the green lines are the nine randomized trials and the blue ones are a mix of randomized trials and registries. And you can see pretty clearly that the impact of imaging on all outcomes is pretty striking, right? With a very low, uh, very short confidence interval. And we also see that the impact of imaging is seen in every lesion, but more effectively in complex lesions than ACS. So the more complex the lesion is, maybe the most benef benefit you're gonna get from imaging. OCT comes in the same direction. There is much less data on OCT guided PCI as compared to angio, but you see that the trend is in the, is in the right place. The only thing is the, the confidence intervals are still pretty wide to allow us to make this strong strong conclusion as we have for IVUS, but the evidence is building up and we will take a look at these um, in the end of this presentation. Daniel, uh, for, mm -hmm. for use of IVUS in, uh, in non-complex PCI, is there any separate trial for that or all this is just derived from sort of well, analysis? There, that yeah, that, that's a good question. There is no specific trial on simple lesions, but there is there are trials on all comers, so you get everything. And then some authors separated the complex lesions from the simple ones. And that's one of the meta-analyses that did that. So they, take, they took a look at the simple lesions and the complex ones. So even in simple lesions, IVUS has a benefit in changing these three outcomes here. And as you move forward to more complex, um, the benefit is even higher. And there's no data showing any advantage for any of the images that we use, either IVUS or OCT, they will perform pretty much the same as far as the evidence tells. There is no signal to, you know, towards one or the other for any um, outcome. So we consider now IVUS and OCT as, as the same for our guidance, for PCI guidance. So these are the two main randomized trials, the largest randomized trials that compared IVUS with Angel. You all know the IVUS XPL and Ultimate. IVUS XPL was, was a trial that was focused on long lesions, more than 28 millimeters. They excluded AMIs, left mains, two stent bifurcation, CTO, and ISR. And the Ultimate was pretty much an all comers trial, and they just excluded CTOs that were not recanalized by obvious reasons, and, um, and severe calcification needing rotational atherectomy because they felt that was unfair with the angio if you don't use imaging for those. So 1,400 patients in each, and um, they defined what would be the optimal criteria. So IVUS XPL was much simpler. Your instant MSA has to be bigger than the distal reference. And ultimate, they use the threefold component here. The MLA has to be more than five or more than 90% of the distal reference they couldn't leave any reference uh, disease behind with black burden less than 50% at the edges and no dissections involving the media by more than three millimeters. They completed five-year follow-up for IVUS XPL and three-year follow-up for Ultimate. And when we look at the primary endpoint of MAZE and TVF, you see that the first, in the first year when this, the primary endpoint was, was properly powered, the, the, the benefit is, is pretty amazing, right? So we're talking about 52% reduction in, the, in, in risk and 47% here. But you see that after the first year, the benefits to continues up to five and three years. The interesting piece of data that I think is very relevant for, for this presentation is when they pulled the two studies together. And since Ultimate has only three year follow-up, they, they stopped IVES XPL here at three years. So everyone pulled a three-year follow-up and they saw that the reduction of events 
is only achievable when you really do IVRs and interact with the imaging and you react to it and you try to optimize the criteria as best as you can, right? So if you don't meet the criteria, if you just do IVRs and just take a qualitative assessment, but you really don't interact and don't try to push the boundaries and get the best result you can, the, the amount of, of events accumulated over three years are the same as those patients that had just angel guided PCI. So we really need to interact and understand imaging. Antonio Colombo has a, a nice sentence that I like. He says, IVUS catheters don't work by intention to treat. We really need to interact and, and, and get the best we can from those images. But Daniel, it, it could be that they attempted to treat it in an appropriate way, but they just ended up with a low MLA, right? Because of you know, just maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe, but they had, they had some, they had some questionnaires on how to, how the operator was intending to use. So they also had a sense on when and how they, they used imaging. Got it. So to, to improve that, so every single trial on IVUS just told us what should we achieve, but they don't tell you how, right? So, you, you know, the criteria you know which MLA you should look for, you know how much black burden you shouldn't live behind, but you don't know how to do that. So for a lot of people from OCT, they got together here in the US and they created this mnemonic algorithm for PCI, which is now uh, being incorporated by IVUS users as well. So it's called the MLD max. So pre-PCI, these are the basic things you should look at, morphology, that needs lesion preparation, length, diameter for sizing. And then after you finish the procedure, you, you need to take a look at if you have complications, uh, if there is malaposition or if your expansion is acceptable. So morphology, calcium is the most important feature that we need, we need to look at. And also it is much better than IVUS. IVUS just allows you to see the arc of calcium and visually determine if this is a superficial calcium, if it's close to the catheter, or if it's a deep calcium, if it's buried deep in the wall. OCT allows a more precise characterization. It gives you the arc of calcium. It allows you to define the borders. So you get the area, you get the thickness, and you, and you can also measure the distance to the lumen. So it, it gives us a much more comprehensive assessment of calcium. There are two scores. Uh, published uh, recently. So for OCT, three variables, the angulation of calcium, more or less than 180, uh, thickness 0.5 millimeters and length more than five. So we, we say that this is the rule of five, 50% of the, of the angle, 0 0.5 thickness, five millimeters length. So it goes from zero to four, the more you have, the lower expansion you, you, you get. IVUS takes a look at the angulation. So they look at the length of calcium per five millimeters that has more than 270 degrees, vessel diameter, and the presence or absence of nodule. So this score goes from zero to three. And again, the more you have, the less expansion you have. For sizing, there are some conceptual differences that we need to take a look at. So lumen is pretty obvious in both. IVUS allows us to, stay, to see the external elastic membrane all the way through. Even in the most stenotic part, you can define what the vessel size is. For OCT, we can take a look at the references, but it's pretty unclear how the vessel size is here. So because of these, it always has been said that OCT cannot see the external elastic membrane, so you shouldn't use OCT for guidance. And if you do it, you're gonna base your assessment in lumen, and then you're gonna end with smaller stents. And that's true. If you do lumen sized against EEM, then you're gonna end up with a smaller stent. The thing is, in more than 85% of the lesions, we can see the external elastic membrane on the references when we are in the most healthy part of the vessel. And this changed the way we do it. So the way we select the landing zones is by IVUS, we take a look at, we try to find regions that have the largest lumens with plaque burden is more than 
every time that it is possible. Sometimes you just have diffuse disease and you need to deal with a high plaque burden. For OCT, since in the beginning, looking at the external elastic membrane was not routine, nobody was measuring plaque burden. So we take a look at the largest lumen that is free of lipid plaques. So the data for IVUS comes from some, you know, a few polled analyses. One is the polled analysis done on the TAXIS trials, and they looked at the reference plaque burden that had uh, an impact on restenosis, and they found with a moderate effect on restenosis that a cutoff of 42% was the best cutoff for plaque burden. There are others that came after that, and this cutoff now ranges from 42 to 48%. So in average, people agree that 50% is the acceptable number. For OCT, the data comes from a publication we did almost a decade ago that we showed on more all, close to 400 stent edges that lending your stent on a plaque, whatever it is, it increases the risk of sections in 6.15 uh, times more than if you'd land on a normal vessel. And if the plaque is a lipid pool with a thin cap fibroateroma, the risk is six times higher than if it's a fibrotic plaque or even a concentric calcium. So for stent sizing, there is an extensive menu, many options, but basically what we need to know is we can measure lumen, we can measure the external elastic membrane in green, and we also have an option to go halfway through the lumen and the EEM, which is called the mid wall. So sometimes you have a high plaque burden, you, you, you can't be as aggressive by the EEM, but you also don't want to be too, too small going with the lumen, then you can go, you know, you have a mid range option here, which is the mid wall measurement. And we're gonna practice that on an everyday basis in the cat lab. And the same is possible for OCT. So by using the external elastic membrane on recent studies, now there are two trials that assess that on a, a systematic way the Illumin3 from the CRF group and the iSight, which was my PhD thesis. Um, and we published this last year. And the protocols are kind of similar, but the bottom line, is here, bottom line here is, these are the only two trials that used the EEM as sizing for OCT. And the result was that the MSA or the expansion is non-inferior to those achieved using the same criteria by IVUS. <laughs> So how I do it in my practice, and this is the protocol that we used in the eyesight trial. For IVUS, we take a look at the vessel. If we can see the EEM and the plaque burden is smaller than 50%, then we get the mean EEM diameter. If not, then we go with the maximum lumen diameter. There was also an option to go mid-wall to mid-wall, but we, we needed to standardize to be consistent across all the operators. For OCT, we do the same. So if the EEM is more than 180 degrees and there's no lipid, then we measure the EEM diameter. Otherwise, we go with the maximum lumen diameter. So we don't measure the plaque burden here. And we size the distal and proximal references according to these, and we see if there is a discrepancy of greater than 0.5 millimeters be between the proximal and distal. If we don't have that, then we size our stent based on the larger measurement. And it can be the EEM or the lumen, but the largest one, so the largest reference. If there is a discrepancy of more than 5.5 millimeters, then we size the stand according to the smaller reference and the post-dilatation post balloon will be sized according to the largest to, for, for the rest of the stand. So these are some examples. This is an IVA simple lesion, but just to show the protocol for IVA's guidance, there is, very tight disease, pretty much fibrotic. So this is the distal reference. This is the proximal. The plaque burden here is 27%. So we go EEM, EEM, and the mean EEM diameter is 3.73. On the other hand, the proximal segment has a plaque burden greater than 50%. So we're going to use the maximum lumen here. So my plan was to have a 3.5 millimeters stent since we don't have 3.75s in Brazil. So 3.5 three was the stent post dilatation with a 3.5 high pressure, or if I had a 3.75, I could do that as well. So 
I think if you get a 3.5 and go really high pressure, you can get to 3.73. For OCT, another case example, this was a long lesion involving a bifurcation, lipid rich plaque, inflammation, but we want to take a look at the references. So the distal reference here uh, has a normal vessel and the proximal reference close to the septal branch here has some fibrotic disease, some calcium here, but you know that's the largest reference. There is no healthy tissue on the proximal LAG. So the distance between the two is 46 millimeters. And when we take a look at the measurement, the EEM is visible in the distal reference. So the mean EEM diameter is 2.7 and the proximal maximum lumen diameter is 3.3. So there is a more than five millimeter difference between the distal and the proximal. So the planning was to size our stenting according to the distal and then use a three five millimeter balloon to fix for the proximal. So post-procedure, take taking a look at the sections. So this is one publication that I did almost a decade ago, and we defined many morphologies. So we have the intimal there, uh, the sections related to the ateroma, which can be lipid, fibrotic, and calcified plaques. And we can have deeper dissections going into the medial layer or the adventitial layer, or even building intramural hematoma. So what is considered, um, we didn't find any uh, factor or measurement. I did so many measurements of the flap opening distance, bays, areas, and distances, and none of these were predictors of adverse events. Maybe because the, the worst dissections have been treated um, already baseline, so there is kind of a, a bias there. So there's no really any measurement that people can prove with data that will predict events. That said, the MLD max group defined significant dissections, the ones that are greater than the media in deepness and occupy more than one quadrant, quadrant of the vessel. The European group says that any dissection going into the media that has more than 60 degrees of vessel circumference by more than two millimeters in length are significant and you should fix. So I pretty much, in my practice, I look at these, Deep, deep dissections, hematomas, and lumen compromise. If Timmy tree flow, you see the dissection, huge flap, but nothing is going on, I leave it uh, without treatment and they usually heal very well. So for apposition, the definition is when you have a, a strut separating from, from the lumen. And again, there is no data correlating acute malapposition with a late event. So what the MLD max group says, more than 300 microns by more than three millimeters, this is a big one, you should treat it. The European guy says more than 400 by less, you no, know, by just a more than a millimeter. So it's pretty much what they think. There's no data, there's nothing. The only thing we have is 300 microns has been defined on a bench study to be the cutoff that separates the, the malaposed stress that heal on, on the first six months from those that delay healing, the more separation you have, the more time you need for healing to cover. Other than that, we don't have data uh, showing, associating acute malaposition with um, late events. So expansion is the most important one. And there are many ways to calculate that. So we define this is the stented segment, we need to identify what is the minimum stent area, which is the MSA, and that's what we call the absolute expansion. Once you get your absolute expansion, then you look at the references and you have your distal and proximal, and you can even average those and compare your MSA against, usually people do the average or the distal according to, the, to some of the IVAS studies. But we need to be aware of the natural vessel tapering. So the difference between the proximal and distal reference diameter will be distributed according to the takeoff of side branches. And the vessel will, will taper proportionate to the size of the vessel of the side branch. So this is a, what we call the fractal nature of coronary arteries. So how do we consider how do we manage these tape, 
you know, vessel tapering. So this is an example of a bifurcation I did uh, a while ago. Um, there was a big side branch. So you see one size here, a big size proximal. So how do we do it? So basically we just need to take a look at the distal to the uh, segment, stented segment distal to the bifurcation we identified. So this was my MSA here compared to the distal reference. I was already 100% expanded. So 5.6, according to the, to the distal, I was more than 100% uh, expand, expanded. So no problem there. We take a look at the proximal segment. And then what I have now is my stent area here is much bigger than the distal, of course, but now I had close to 20% under expansion according to the proximal reference. And that's how we can do that and how we also do by IOS. OCT evolved in the sense that by using the Huokasab um, rule for bifurcation branching, the machine measures every side branch uh, osteo and adjusts the lumen according to the size of each side branch. In a sense that now, when you take a look at this case, it was a decay crush, so stent in the diagonal, long stent in the LAG. I did my final control with OCT, and geographically, it looks fine. And I found one region here in C, where my stent was really not well expanded. This area was 3.6, that's the region, MLA 3.6, so very focal. I said, okay, go back, short balloon, I expand that. And this was 20% underexpanded according to the distal. So if I could have this ideal lumen, knowing what my stent should look like in the entire segment, instead of just taking a look at one segment when I did a 48 millimeter stent, this would be much better. And that's what the minimum expansion index does. So adjusts for the side branches and gives you frame by frame, what is the ideal lumen that you should achieve? So everything that is in white is an expansion above 90% according to the ideal lumen based on the vessel tapering. So my 3.6 here is underexpanded. Everything that is in red is below 80%. So I'm underexpanded here. The only thing I wasn't expecting was to have my entire proximal segment underexpanded at 68% from the ideal size I should have from the diagonal to the proximal edge. This is something that if you just focus on the MSA, you'll lose these and these will be hugely under uh, optimized. So after fixing this though and doing another pot with the proper balloon size, now I got 99% expansion and 100% expansion there. So just be aware of vessel tapering. And now we have much more comprehensive ways of doing that. And on this publication, this new metric was together with the final FFR, the only two independent predictors of um, device oriented cardiac events. The CRF group has published last year uh, an interesting paper that looks at many expansion criteria. And they came up with this MSA divided by the vessel area at the MSA. And this was the only predictor of events in the ADAPT DS study. So they identified a cutoff. If you look at the MSA at the, as compared to the vessel size at the MSA size, 38% or 39% is the cutoff that separates the ones that are going to evolve well and from the ones that are going to have more um, events. Interestingly enough, this is only significant when your MSA is also low. So the thing is, if you have a positive remodeling, but your vessel is well expanded to the references and um, your MSA to vessel is smaller than 39%, but still your MSA is big and you're okay against the references, there is no much difference in terms of events. But if your MSC is small, then you should worry about that. So how I see that happening, we should have a logistic approach. So this is an IVOS pullback after stenting. This is the MSA here, 9.36, pretty high for, for the vessel size. So I always take a look at the MSA. We are looking at the most stenotic in the stent site. Then, you see if this MSA is okay to the vessel size you're treating, 
And then we calculate the relative expansion. How big or small your MSA is to that particular vessel. And if you have the vessel tapering adjustment, which is manual for IVAS or automatic for OCT, that's much better. And then you take a look at the EEM at the MSA site and you see the relation. And then you're, you're gonna adjust for vessel remodeling. So all, all these look at different things. We're looking at the most stenotic lumen. Then we see how big we are according to the vessel. And then we see how big we are according to the lesion remodeling. So you combine all three and then you get a, an optimal result. I know we are kind of advancing in time, so I'll try to show some couple examples here. One that I really like is the bifurcation concept. And we learned over time that if we do a main vessel pullback and we try to estimate the side branch ostium, we're going to run into problem because we're always looking at the side branch in an oblique way, and that's how we see it. So we learned that we also need to take a take another pullback from the side branch. So now we are perpendicular to the ostium in order to properly assess the branch, right? So that's standard. That's how we used uh, IVRS all the years. So OCT has this feature that allows us to rotate a main vessel pullback and really be perpendicular to the side branch. So you can really take a look real time on your side branch origin. So you, you just rotate and you become perpendicular to the vessel. This is one application. So this was kind of a simple, this was a distal left main lesion. I did a stent from the left main to the, through the LED involving this trifurcation here. So the, according to the angiographic appearance, this looks fine, but we are always concerned about struts hanging across these, you know, these side branches over here. So should I do kissing balloon, tracing balloon? So when I looked at my OCT post, if you look at the side, the origin of the left circ, the circ is smaller than the ramus. And when you look at the ostium, it's already positioned on an opening of the stent cell. So if I do kissing here, I'll gain nothing. It's already pretty open. And when we look at the ramus, I have one stent strut that is crossing, but if you look at the effective area, it's pretty big. So in order to have any gain, I need to recross according, you know, on this distal cell, which is not always guaranteed, and then push these struts here to the top. So if I cross here, which is usually easier, then I'll deform my stent distal, and maybe this is much worse than leaving this strut here. So now we have this way of qualitatively assessing that and adding more information to our decision on the cat lab. And this is another case that I did, one bifurcation, LAG diagonal, our OCT pre, you see the LAG here, the ostium of the side branch. Although it looks pinched here, look how big it is. You see the, the guide wire protecting the branch. So I decided to give it a shot and forget about these and try to, to do my you know, provisional stenting. So what I did was LAG stenting, much uh, worse pinching with slow flow in the diagonal. But what we see here, look at how is this ostium here. And what I, what I did is I pushed the carina towards the side branch. So the carina was pushed here. And the big opening I had now is like this slit like um, with slow flow. So I recrossed, I did all the work and another stent there. And now I, brought the carina back to the main vessel. You know, it's centered um, where it should be. And we have your stent here and my opening to the side branch. So we can really take a look at these dynamic changes that we have during the, the procedures. And on the future, we'll be able, so this is a software that is, we can use in a core lab environment for offline analysis. And we can really do planimetry of the ostium and see these changes over time. Hopefully one day we'll have this online in the cat lab as well. But there are also very helpful signs and easy to, to see on, to predict side branch pinching. One is these, what we call the eyebrow sign. So this is a bifurcation. Every time you see this carina protruding more than the origin of the side branch, this is a problem. When you put your stent here, you're gonna 
push this towards the side branch, right? So what happens is, in this case, I did a, an absorbable scaffold. When I did the scaffold, I had no protection here, and my carina now is obstructing the branch. So this is what we call a carina shift. And we should have, every time you see this here, you should have a guide wire protecting the branch to prevent it from closing. So I don't know why people call these the eyebrow sign. Uh, it doesn't look like an eyebrow to me, but that's how it's called. And uh, we should be aware of that. It's very simple to, to identify and can also you know, prevent some complications. Guided left main, um, this is a kind of a long case that I'm gonna go further. So this patient had, um, you know, resting episodes of angina, angio didn't show much. The only thing that called my attention when the fellow's image uh, did the cath was that the left main size was not that much bigger than the parent vessel, than, than the daughter vessels. Uh, there was some dampening also when they were engaging the catheter in the left main ostium. And then we did physiology, which was pretty significant. And we could see one long step across the LAD here and another focal here, very significant in the left main. So we decided to treat Ivers, always do main vessel. So we can see calcification here in the distal left main. The area was 3.73. Uh, the ostium is free of disease, um, free of stenosis, but the calcium goes up to the ostium. The bifurcation was kind of free, some disease in the LAD ostium here. The circ to my surprise, was very tight. So a calcified nodule here, some remodeling in the left circ ostium, negative remodeling with plaque, and then the, the left main, again, diseased up to the ostium. Key measurement for sizing, we already covered that. So I decided to do a nano, nano DK crush. The patient was feeling really unstable with the seventh French here. So I needed the balloon that I was going to use for crushing. I needed to inflate that to give it some flow and have time to proper position my left circ stent. So I, I did that, inflated, crush. Um, that's the control angel after crushing. Position my stent in the ostium. Now the left main LAG stenting, careful positioning to cover the ostium, deployment pulling back a little bit, expanding more, POT, recrossing, circ dilatation, final kissing, and that's the left circ assessment. So we see still some under expansions here in the proximal left circ. I went back for more optimization, did another kissing balloon, some improvement now from 5.8 to 7.15, some gains in the circ, which was very nice to see the ostium is here, well expanded as well. But then when I did that and looked at the left main, what I saw was this kind of deformation here that was not present in the beginning. So we know that according to the Excel data, this is not so frequently, but it happens in 6.5%. But when it happens, the chance of events, the risk of events is twofold higher than if you don't. So you always need to take a look at the ostium of the left main at all times during, during this kind of intervention. Another optimization there. And then now we corrected, and this is the LAG also very well expanded. We corrected the deformation, the left main, nice areas. So for OCT left main, the major concerns are the vessel size, which is too big for OCT. It's not possible to visualize the r osteo junction and it requires too much contrast. We did a kind of pilot study on, you know, 29 OCT runs in the left main um, on 18 consecutive patients. And I have close to 2000 cross sections of OCT in the left main. And this is a frame quality classification. So everything that is red, there is some blood obscuring the vessel in kind of 72 degrees of the vessel. So you see that you might have some blood contamination towards the ostium, but still most of the cross sections are visible. And we're looking at vessels that range from 3.2 to 6.0. And we used 8.9 uh, cc's of contrast to do the entire left main, which was kind of very nice and with good quality image. And we just needed to you know, retract the guiding catheter from the left main and the, 
the main distance that I got was 0.8 millimeters. So less than less than one millimeter should be ideal if you are coaxial with the left main. And this is one example. The fellows called me, was dampening here, some ambig ambiguity there. So we did OCT. That's the shot when we, we imaged. You know, the catheter is a little bit retracted. You see the sinus here. And that's what we have. The bifurcation, the distal left main, meat, prox, and ostium. And you see that there is disease close to the ostium. And um, there is some, some residual blood. You see some, these kind of cloud of, contrast swirling with blood, but it still, it doesn't affect the quality for assessment. And uh, we could see the entire left main until it opens to the aorta. And this image here is what I'm calling the ghost sign. It's pretty similar to this little ghost. Um, let me jump um, a little bit further, take a look at CTOs. And um, for CTO, we have a specific use of imaging IVOS is the preferred imaging here. Um, and in the anti-grade uh, approach, IVOS can also identify ambiguous caps and identify the, ent the ideal entry point for puncture. When we're doing single or parallel wire technique, um, this was one case that I went sub in the beginning, then I used IVOS to guide myself and then I, could ma I managed to get interluminal again. Another case that I was subintimo with a huge hematoma compressing the, 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 the vessel. So this is for re-entry, this is bad, right? So there is a big hematoma, so it, it'll make our life much difficult. But when you see that you're in subintimo close to the lumen, this is maybe the one uh, image that is more favorable for re-entry. On retrograde, I don't have cases of retrograde IVs, but um, it's pretty much on identifying you know, the location of both the anti-grade and retrograde wires. And we want to take a look at uh, the worst feature. So when you are the, with the retrograde intraluminal and the anti-grade subintimal, that's when you fail the most and you have more complications. So this is data from the CRF group on, on IVUS for retrograde PCI. And we can also take a look at the proximal vessel integratedly and see what is the best size for reverse cart when you, you're re-entering. So after you recanalize, imaging can also be used and should be used for guiding your procedure, you know, stand size and length. And if you use IVUS during the, uh, you know, in many steps of the procedure, you also save contrast and minimize uh, integrated injections. For ultra low contrast, IVUS is also preferred. This is a case of a young patient, diabetic, uh, end stage renal disease. So very um, diseased lady. She had, uh, you know, pro recent pro progression of angina with resting episodes and this very tight LED. It seems to be a very straightforward lesion. So this was the cath. I brought her back five days after the cath. So renal function was still stable. So what I usually do, I use the angel from the cat as my roadmap. So I have it on the side monitor. I try to engage the left main, usually give some saline shots and you see these changes in the EKG. So it means that you are selective. So you don't need contrast to check that. So this is the cat. So I, I use the same angulation and I do what I call the metallic silhouette. So I, I identify the septal, identify the second diagonal. I put one guide wire there, another there. And I know that my, the distance between the two wires is the segment where I have my disease. So I advance the IVUS catheter and manually I come to this segment and I try to see if I have any proper landing zone. And to my surprise here, the most normal looking vessel was distal to the second diagonal down here. So I stop here and I start recording from here all the way back to the left main. And what I found was that the lesion, although it looks focal, was a very severe and diffuse disease up to the LED ostium where you see this very eccentric black burden. So there was no way to just put a, a short stent here. I needed to come from this segment all the way back to the ostium. After doing that with two stents, under IVUS guidance, this is the final result. And then we took just two shots to see, you know, the LED and, and the circ flow, six cc's of contrast in total. A few words of failure. Uh, this is a case of um, 
subacute uh, stent thrombosis. This LED diagonal bifurcation was done. I didn't know about the technique, so I put a wire, a small balloon, timid tree flow, and I, now I, I have time to think. I did imaging. I saw a lot of thrombus here on this hazy uh, area. I saw that the struts were floating across the diagonal branch with some thrombus around. So no kissing balloon was done uh, on the index procedure. But in the proximal reference here, we see that the stent is fully underexpanded due to the calcified nodule that we have here with a very high eccentricity. So I fixed my proximal, I did a proper pot with a non-compliant balloon, 30 atmospheres on a short balloon, and I initiated uh, to be three inhibitors due to the high thrombus burden. And that's my final result. Still some residual thrombus here, better opening of the side branch and much better expansion now from 2.2 to 6.8. So CT was important for me to identify the mechanism and try to and guide my management. Another case of an 82 year old um, that had a left main LED stent six months before. She comes with resin angina, high troponins, and this left circ here is pinched. So we look at IVUS. I couldn't cross the IVUS here to the circ in the beginning. So I did a run from the LED. And the stent in the LED was pretty well expanded. Very nice result. But when I got to the left main, I saw that the struts were totally crushed to the, to the left circ side. So what happened is, the left main was so big that they crossed behind and when they kissed, they just crushed the left main stent. So all this, this left main segment was crushed and that's the cause of these restenosis and ACS on the follow-up. Assessment of late stent failure. So these are three cases that had stents implanted for more than two years and they come again with an infarct. So non-STEMI, STEMI, STEMI. You see thrombus in all the stented segments. Thrombus here, thrombus here. This lady had two bare metal stents, one here and one occluded here. So the, the first one we see unhealed or lack of healing with thrombus and malaposition. And again, a lot of thrombus with not healed st stents after five years. So this was a first generation uh, DES. The second one, on the other hand, is fully healed, but now the, there was a change in healing and we have a lipid laden neointima, which is a neoatherosclerosis that ruptured and generated this thrombus. And the other one, the stent was a bare metal. So there is a lot of NIH, but the stent was pretty well, nicely healed, no neoatherosclerosis, no rupture, no nothing. And what happened was a lipid plaque down the vessel that ruptured. So it's a lesion progression and the thrombus kept, you know, accumulating proximally and it stopped just at the stent site. Upcoming evidence is on the imaging uh, improve with IVUS is a 1400 uh, trial that will look at complex lesions, ISR, long lesions, bifurcations, calcifications, and CTO. There are two primary endpoints, clinical and imaging. And this is ongoing and we should have uh, data, I believe next year. There are four major trials on OCT that will add to 7,500 patients. So there is the Illumian 4, which is also taking a look at some complex uh, population, diabetics, non-STEMI, long lesions, two-stand bifurcation, severe calcification, CTO and ISRs. The October, which is totally focused on bifurcation lesions, including left main bifurcations, Occupy complex lesions, AMI, CTOs, long lesions, calcification, bifurcation lesions, unprotected left main, which is nice to see that it's not an, an exclusion here, small vessels, thrombus and ISR thrombosis, and octopus, which is taking a look at STEMI, cardiogenic shock, and renal dysfunction. So it's a, a nice pipeline of studies that are coming. I believe that the Illumin 4 in October are more advanced in enrollment and the other two is still ongoing. So many data to come for the future. And to finalize this, just to say a few words about the temporal use of imaging. So you see, even in the US, the use is pretty low. It's 6.9%. So it's variable on STEMI 5.5 and another registry here on more than 4 million lesions treated. You see that IVUS, FFR and OCT use are very, very low. 
There was a, a recent research on the EAPCI in Europe that involved European and Asian uh, interventionalists. So it was nice to see that half of this population has more than, you know, has experience with imaging in more than 15% of the patients and mostly dri driven by the Japanese folks here, right? So when you look at the indications for imaging, still most use it to optimization and not properly guidance. Guidance is coming second place, but it's catching up. So the importance of pre-PCI imaging is, is catching up. And the factors, the main factors that limit the usage is cost, right? Reimbursement is still a problem. But if you take a look at all the reasons, people feel that uh, prolongs the procedure. So that's something to me that it doesn't make sense to spend a few minutes and get precision and optimization here. There are some reimbursement issues, lack of training. And this is something that we are really interested to uh, really advance this lack of training. <laughs> And this was a survey conducted at the annual CRF course between 2018 and 2019. So all the fellows, the, these are cardiology, interventional cardiology fellows that came for, for the course and they were given um, a survey and they had to report their feeling if they have expert training, sufficient training, rudimentary or no training in imaging and physiology. So, Expert training or sufficient training were reported by 95 of the fellows, 82% of the, for IVUS and 46% of OCT. So they felt they were pretty well trained, especially for physiology and IVUS. And this is the, you know, the survey. If they are just assessing many competencies uh, on the imaging, even to set up and do all the quantifications that are needed right, to identify length, diameter, MSA, the sections, and so on. And then after they responded this, they went back and, and saw that, in fact, for imaging, they have, they, only 15% of the respondents would be independent in all competencies to really be able to do imaging by themselves, and 18% for OCT, which is ridiculously low and there is a lot of room for improvement and that's why we're you know building this intravascular imaging program at Yale which as Dr. Lansky mentioned is composed of a core lab side and the cat lab side on the core lab we're really driven by sponsored research we're also developing some academic collaborations for technology and methodology development trying to come with some innovations, having imaging fellows after finishing their interventional training who are spent some time here just to learn imaging. And of course, try to get some publications out. In the CAT lab, we're gonna work on a structured use of intravascular imaging, bring new technology to the CAT lab, better imaging, other options, to really engage in training the in, in, in invasive, uh, interventional cardiology fellows and technicians, build a dedicated database and hopefully improved quality of imaging, interpretation and quality of care. And at, at some point, those two core lab and cat labs, they will merge uh, as much as I can do it to generate local research from all the attendees in a cat lab, get publications out from our group and not having to refer to others you know, really engage in training courses, be a hub here in Yale to bring people from outside and really train them here and be leaders in this field. And I, you know, again, I, I'll stop here. I pretty much thank you for all the reception and, and the time dedicated. Thank you very much. Hey, Daniel, this is Steve. Uh, thanks for a great overview. And let me just say at the beginning, um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to work in a case with Daniel, um, he's a great resource. I've considered myself not an expert, but a pretty experienced on intravascular imaging. And just a brief time, he's taught me a lot that I thought I knew, but I didn't know very well. So thanks for that. My question is that um, you know you have data that regardless of lesion type, there is incremental improvement in outcomes with intravascular imaging. But as you point out, you know, uh, reimbursement remains an issue. And for those of us in the EO lab, there's practical aspects too, right? There's only one OCT console. So there's four labs. If we all wanna do OCT on every lesion, 
it's not really going to work. And, and, you know, sometimes there's struggles with getting the IVIS to work too. So I, my question is, do you have any algorithm or any information where the best, um, you know, cost benefit um, works, you know, are there angiographic determinants that you can say, yeah, this lesion, you know, has pretty low uh, payback if I do intravascular imaging, you know, it's a pretty straightforward lesion that type, it's likely I'll do fine. Um, and I can defer intravascular imaging. So we all know that there's the complex lesions, the calcified stuff, we, it really yeah. helps. But is there any way to kind of prospectively say this lesion has low yield to get benefit from intravascular imaging? Yeah, so th that's a great question. And I don't know if I have the proper answer for that. Uh, I, I would be cliche here in saying that the opposite is pretty standard. We, we acknowledge that left main calcifications, long lesions, bifurcations, these are the ones that benefit the most. But he, he, you saw, just saw here the, the, the case that, uh, that from that young lady, focal LAG lesion, very simple, right? Three, four lesion. And then it was a severe disease involving two bifurcations, osteo lesion. So uh, I would say that, you know, when you have normal vessels, you can identify normal references angiographically and you have a limited lesion no much prediction of calcium no involvement of major branches these should be the ones you know meat segments this should be the one that you could try give it a try with angio but i always have my my limits you know very low for imaging use if i feel that something is not working properly the balloon is not opening okay i have a doubt of there is a hazy image distal you know on the edge uh i would do imaging afterwards but um, i think those lesions would be the ones that you could do without imaging you know just by angel the thing is we, we learned from so much from imaging even in the yeah. simple lesions then but anyway. i agree but it, it's you know practically speaking that can be yeah, challenging yeah. So. But we are we are working. So that's good to mention that we are working with other companies to bring more equipment to Yale. So there is another OCT company which has FDA approval, and they have a longer pullback length, 100 millimeters, on a smaller profile catheter. It's 1.8 French, as compared to the 2.7 that we use now. Uh, much faster pullback. It's 100 frame per second, which is we do a 100 millimeter vessel in one second. So we will use less contrast, faster images, longer vessels, and there will be a second machine um, in the cat lab. Great, thank you. Awesome, great. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was an awesome talk. Um, so I think we're we'd be on time here, but that was. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's totally. You know, everybody was. Really I lost my. I, I lost my time. Really good talk, Daniel. It was really good. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Until next week. Well, I'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you.